Well, uh, kia ora te whanau. Uh, welcome to another Cafe Scientific. Tēnā koe, ko Scott Pilkington aho. So um, welcome back to our ca Cafe Scientific series and for our second session of this year. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Scott Pilkington and I uh, am part of the team that helped run it. And I'll be covering the admin things for tonight before I hand over to our MC. Uh, for those who don't know, the Cafe Scientific series is brought to you by the Auckland Museum Institute, the Auckland branch of the Royal Society Te Aparangi. Now we just have a couple of admin and housekeeping things to run through before we get started, which also allows any latecomers to come in too without uh, missing too much. We uh, have muted everybody's microphones and disabled screen sharing. Uh, so if you would like to ask any questions, please drop them down in the chat. Um, I will so yeah, any questions or comments, drop them in the chat. We are recording the first portion of tonight's presentation and it will appear on YouTube sometime next week. Um, you are welcome to have your camera on if you wish. This does, and to some extent, this does have our speakers. It means that when they, they look at the screen, they do see other faces and people smiling and nodding and helps them to gauge where they are in their talk. Um, but please be aware that there is a really good chance that you'll appear in the Zoom recording. Um, so if you don't want to appear in the Zoom recording, please turn your camera off. Now, now we have a range of exciting events planned for you for this year. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick preview of the ones that are coming up in the next couple of months. Uh, so of course, first up, we do have, there we go, tonight's Cafe Scientifique, um, which you're all here for and everyone's excited. No pressure to our lovely uh, speakers. Uh, then coming up very, very soon next week, our first ever Conversazione and of this year and I'll, and the first conversazione in about a hundred years because the last one uh, was in about the 1920s. Marguerite no doubt is going to, to, to say actually it was in and then give me an exact date. Um, the first one is who were the other cheesemans with Margaret Durling, Marguerite Durling who is the vice president of the Auckland Museum Institute and she's going to be talking about her research into the rest of the Cheeseman family. We know a lot about Thomas Cheeseman. He was the uh, he was the director and curator of Auckland museum for many, many years. Um, but this is going to be talking about the roles that the rest of his family and particularly his sisters uh, had. Next month's uh, cafe is Squidology 102 with the infamous uh, Kat Bolstead, um, who will be talking to us about the real weirdos. Uh, she famously spoke to us in 2019 about giant squid. Um, this one will be back in the horse and trap, will be back to in person. Um, and so no doubt she will bring something for us to take a gander at while we're there. In June, we've got um, Dan Hikaroa returning. He last presented to us about, I think, eight years ago. Um, he's going to be talking about Matariki, an introduction to Matariki, Mat Matamatanga and uh, Mataranga, um, just in time for our brand new Matariki holiday. So um, we're looking forward to having Dan back. Uh, then our first ever, our inaugural humanities lecture is going to be, and oops, I didn't update, I still didn't update the date. My uh, apologies for that. It's Tuesday, the 5th of July. Uh, we've got um, Vincent O'Malley. There we go. Oh, look at that. I updated it in live time. I'm amazing. Uh, Vincent O'Malley giving our inaugural humanities lecture on the Great War for New Zealand and the making of Auckland. Um, details of that uh, will be up online soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and of course, if you're a Auckland Museum Institute member, you will get an email uh, where you can book. It, it will be online um, on the 5th of July. Uh, and then th the final thing uh, that I'm going to talk about is Cafe for July, um, which is Annette Semadini Davis from Niwa talking about catchment modeling for water quality and what it can and cannot tell us. Of course, if you're not a member of the Auckland Museum Institute, there we go. Now's a great time to join. You can go to the Auckland Muse Museum website, go to uh, join now, and then there's a few options and you're looking for this one, the Auckland Museum Institute member, and you can scroll down and there are options. So there we go. So that's that's all the admin stuff out of the way. I will now hand over to our fantastic MC for the evening, uh, Marilyn Kolhasi. Thank you very much. Uh, kia ora, Pacific greetings. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be emceeing this program um, uh, uh, tonight on ancient futures. This um, 
project was funded by the Royal Society of New Zealand, Te Aparangi, um, and also uh, Te Aparangi, and also with a, with a Marsden grant and supported by Creative New Zealand. And it brought together academics and artists to work together to interpret ancient, late 18th century and early 19th century Tongan arts and their legacies, the future. It consisted of a team of Dr. Phyllis Herder, who's a, a historian and anthropologist, Dr. Billy Lithberg, an art historian and anthropologist, and Dr. Melanaiti Tomoi Falao, a linguist, and they're all um, of the University of Auckland, as well as Hilary Scotthorn, who is an independent scholar. There were also international scholars, plus the an extensive Tongan diaspora involved. The artists were the two Aotearoa-based senior artists, Dagmar Vaikalafi Daik and Sopole Malama Felipe Tohi. For five years, this Ancient Futures team examined art objects of exchange and encounters between Tongan Islanders and European visitors to the archipelago in the late 18th and 19th centuries. They examined objects now held in museum collections in over 30 museums in Europe, North America, Asia, and Australia and Aotearoa. They explored continuity within contemporary practices innovation in the arts of the Tongan ancestors and their descendants, seeking to reclaim and repatriate Tonga and its diaspora, the knowledge systems encoded in woven, layered, wrapped and carved objects. Phyllis and Dagmar will share some of the table talk from their visits. What they share is knowledge and expertise, both based on the rich interaction from the different disciplines involved in the project. The opinions and insights of the artists and academics alike added to the often sparse written details with each object where various intersections were both unpredictive and highly generative. They regarded the objects not only as objects of exchange, but also as the multilingual discourses vocabularies and artistic traditions that are their legacies. The research pivoted on close examination of the artifacts and their records from manuscripts and old obscure publications. The project reinstates their genealogies and intrinsic cultural and historical values and develops new conceptual frameworks. Collapsing disciplinary boundaries, but always adhering to the values the project was founded on, including whaka apa apa, or respect for each other's observations, was intrinsic to the success of this valuable project. Uh, what, I, what I've drawn from and what I've said to you is this um, wonderful catalogue that um, Talk, gives more information about the whole project, including a conference that was held and photographs of um, the works of Dagmar and Felipe at a, an exhibition that was held at Wallace um, Homestead Art Gallery. And this publication is available from Room Books. So Dr. Phyllis Herder has worked across anthropology, Pacific history and women's gender studies. She began working in Tonga in the 1980s and researching and publishing on Tongan ethnography, European explorers in the Pacific, Polynesian art and material culture, Tongan oral tradition and history, gender, disease and colonialism, as well as Pacific Polynesian textiles, traditional and contemporary. Phyllis has taught at Victoria University and recently retired from the University of Auckland. Her degrees are from the University of Arizona, the University of Auckland and ANU, where she has a PhD in Pacific history. She is now part of that uh, very, very exclusive um, class of retired people, uh, I'm one too, and she um, is now going to devote her uh, considerable uh, 
uh, experience and knowledge to writing, which she's very much looking forward to. Um, she's recently moved house and um, that takes a lot of uh, effort and energy. So we're very, very appreciative of the, uh, her pulling together a talk for this evening. Dagmar Vaikalafi Dyke is one of the two artists involved. I've mentioned Felipe Tohi earlier. And she's of Tongan, Dutch, Polish, and German ancestry. She is an interdisciplinary artist, researcher, and art educator, and social justice advocate. She was the first Tongan woman to graduate in 1995 from the Elam School of Arts at the University of Auckland with a postgraduate diploma in fine arts. She has, has exhibited nationally and internationally and her works are held in significant collections. She has an MA uh, professional honours in education from the University of Auckland where she focused on uh, culturally sustainable pedagogies within the visual arts. She is currently a member of the Auckland Museum Specific Advisory Group, along with other governance roles. She previously taught at um, Sylvia Park School and was the acting uh, principal for some time and has recently joined the University of Auckland. So that's the background to this evening's um, Amui i Mua, Ancient Futures. And so Dr. Phyllis Herder is going to speak first, and then uh, Dagmar Vaikalafi Dyke will um, follow. Over to you, Phyllis. What I want to do, and I want to thank Scott and Marilyn for organizing this, and I want to give you just a brief um, introduction visually of the people that Marilyn talked about, or some of them. This is a um, picture of um, some of the research group um, at um, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at Cambridge. And I want to start with this because it was such a pleasure and it is still a pleasure, although we're in a very different phase now of the project, to work with the group and, the, and where we went and what we did. Um, going from um, the, my left is Felipe Tohi, um, the other artist. Um, involved senior artist involved in the project. And we had the notion that with both Dagmar and Felipe, and Dagmar is on um, the right of the screen, that um, we wanted this not to just be the academics getting together to discuss what was happening um, with the artifacts and what the artifacts were, but also to include artists. And we found that, that what they had to share around the table was incredible and very different to what we were getting from the academics, um, but also for them to respond within their own art to what they were seeing at the various institutions that we went to. So it was really quite exciting. Next to Felipe is um, Andy Mills, who's at the University of Glasgow. And he and um, Von Uves, who is holding the, who's in the front with the purple bag, were, um, um, associate members of the project. So we had the core group who is pictured here, um, but except for um, Melanite who wasn't able to come on this part of the trip, but we also had associates who would join us at particular points and for particular museum visits. And that was really, really special because once again, we got the expertise of people um, coming in and overall the general table talk um, as, as I'll talk about again uh, in a few moments, became more than the sum total of the individuals who were there. So right from the word go, we were, we were getting a, a much rounder vision of what we were seeing and where it fit in terms of Tonga. Next to Andy is um, Billy Lithberg. And next to Billy is Uncle Dennis, um, Dagmar's Uncle Dennis. And this was again, a wonderful part of our project that we had family, various family members who joined us at various times. Um, Dakota, um, who is the daughter of Felipe and Hilary Scott Horn, who's um, pictured next to me, I'm in the polka dot coat, um, was at the um, many, many of our museum visits. Um, she was off visiting friends and relatives at this particular time. 
Um, my daughter um, visited um, and came with us on many of the, the visits. She again was wandering around Cambridge while we were looking at the museum. And Dagmar's daughter joined as well. And we found this to be a really, again, enriching part of the project and so different from other projects, um, research projects that you normally do, but one that we, we embraced and loved and made the project that much richer, I think. As I said, the table talk was um, always incredible. And it was some, a couple of visits we had before the project began that actually came, the, the idea of it came about. And as I said, we found that the not viewing things alone, but rather doing it in a group increased our understanding. And also um, everyone had different things that they were interested in looking at. So it pointed out different things when we were looking at various artifacts. So this happened to be um, two Tongan clubs um, at the Museo de America in Madrid. Also, what was really interesting, it was at that same visit and we were there for a conference that here you see Andy Mills with Hillary Scott Horn's phone and that is Dakota on the picture, the bits that you can see of her. And he's, he had said while we were talking, um, he really wished Felipe was there to talk about the, the various clubs and what was going on with them. Hillary said, okay then, and handed him her phone and um, Andy was able to show things, and that's what he's doing here, to Felipe, who was feeding Dakota her breakfast in Auckland. And so this got us the idea, and hearing their discussion, we thought, right, academics have been missing out on the expertise and the views of artists in terms of looking at what are Tongan, ancient Tongan art. So that was when we started um, um, thinking about how we'd put together a... Um, an application for funding in order to do a project that would go to the various institutions, museums um, around the world that held um, uh, Tongan artifacts, significant Tongan artifacts, and how we would get together. Luckily, the um, uh, Royal Society agreed with us and saw this not as a problem, but as a, a really good innovation. So we're very grateful to them for funding us. So with this team, um, we went around um, looking at um, um, early European explorers and later on it also included some early missionaries who went to Tonga and met Tongan aristocracy and that were welcomed by them and were hosted and these, these elite hosted them during their stays. And this involved lavish feasting an elaborate exchange of gifts. And I think you need to remember that in terms of gift exchange, um, the Polynesian um, peoples, uh, you know, do it with incredible skill and finesse. And many of the early anthropologists who began looking at, including Maus, looked at um, the ideas of exchange and what they meant beyond just the transfer of goods, um, socially what they meant, based a lot of their studies on um, uh, examples from Polynesia. So we became very, very interested in the objects themselves. And here you see an exquisite one from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. It's a sisi fale, a, a kind of a, an apron or a skirt as some of the Europeans called them. That was just, just magnificent. So we became interested in that. And what we found was that um, Many, if not most of the items that we looked at that were gifted by the elite were really exquisite pieces of Tongan art. And that um, it, because of this, we were able to look at um, the best of the best. These items were made for people, many of whom were regarded as divine. So the, the skilled craftsmen and women who were making these items were doing it for people that they believed to be gods. So you can imagine the kind of the sense of awe that we had in terms of uh, looking at things and flipping them over and looking at how they were made. And again, the artists at this point um, were fabulous in terms of you know, their notion and understanding of what was going on in terms of producing these objects. Um, when the explorers left the islands, um, many of these items were um, given to European elites when they returned to, um, home. And because of that, they became valued artifacts 
and exotic souvenirs of the people and the cultures they encountered. Many, not all, but many of these precious pieces are now in Western institutions. So we visited some of these institutions in Europe, the UK, USA, Japan, and Aotearoa. Um, uh, we were then able to um, go to Tonga to give our first results seminar, which was quite exciting because there was also an art exhibition that ran alongside it of Tongan artists um, from the islands, but also from the wider diaspora, which was, was really very good. Unfortunately, COVID intervened at about that time and we were not able to get to Australia or Fiji. Um, and we were hoping to, to look at, again at what they had, but it was, it was a, good, a good effort in terms of trying to get around to see as much as we could. There's a lot more out there still, but we went where we could and picked carefully in terms of where we could spend some time. Um, this was an exquisite um, ivory carving held at the British Museum in London that um, was presumably of the Tongan goddess Hikuleo, or some people are now believing they were just female ancestors of certain lineages that were presented, but they're just a handful of them um, um, that have survived um, from those early times. And um, three are held at the um, Auckland Museum. So we were lucky in the sense of being able to see these items, not just at Auckland, but further afield. Um, we also went to the Field Museum in Chicago. And again, it was an interesting visit because they held a, a fantastic collection known as the Fuller Collection. And Fuller was a um, collector in London who collected from the, er the late 1890s right up until about World War II. And in the end, sold his collection to the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, he got, fell out a bit with the people at the British Museum. So it ended up in the United States and the collection was fabulous. And so we spent quite a bit of time there uncovering true gems. This one in particular is the, the head of a Tongan club. And you can see the carving that was done there and the carving in particular of the one individual with the headdress on. What we found in, and Andy Mills was the one who, who was able to point this out to us, is that Tongan clubs are probably the most um, numerous items in Polynesian collections in, um, in the world, in museums. And we are fairly certain seeing a variety of clubs, both um, collected in the 1770s or gifted in the 1770s and the 1790s, that by the time of the 1790s, when more explorers were coming to the Pacific and to Tonga in particular, that what could be described as the first tourist art happened. And it was quite clear that Tongans were carving um, not in exactly the same way that they had in the 1770s, but these were being produced to gift to Europeans who were coming. And so that was quite an exciting idea of kind of understanding how Tongans were responding at the time to Europeans coming to their shores. Um, for me, um, you know, everybody had their thing that they were interested in. And for me, it was about identifying the individuals whom the explorers met, and in many cases, identifying the Tongan ar aristocrats who were um, presenting items to um, the Europeans who visited. So being able to establish that genealogy of who, who didn't, we don't know who made them, but we certainly had a sense of who was gifting them. So on the left, we have a, a watercolor that was made by the French exploration team that was there in March and April of 1793 of Fuanunuiava, who later became um, the Tuitonga, and um, Mamui, who was probably um, Tui Kanakapolu at the time. And again, it was one of our results of identifying not Fua Nunuiava, he was already known, but that the other individual in that watercolor was um, Tuikanakapolo Mumui. And um, the present royal family descends from him. And so it was quite exciting to be able to show people uh, the image of, uh, of their ancestors as created by um, 
the French explorers and Brun Brunei Dante Castel is presented in the other, other picture there because that was the encounter, the social and town encounter between the elites of both groups at the time. I was also very interested in the Malaspina expedition, which visited Wawa'u, which is the northern group in Tonga, between May and June 1793. And um, they met an individual known as Vuna. And again, it was quite exciting to know that um, who Vuna was. He was an individual who lost out in Tongan history in many ways. And um, an anthropologist that worked with Queen Salote in the late 1950s and 60s identified that individual as being actually um, Tuiha Takalawa Fa Tusia. And through the work of the project, and very recently I've had confirmed that that's not who this individual is, that in fact he is of in an individual named Vuna Tue Teao. And so again, it's that notion of being able to situate who these people are and what they presented. And this is a um, feathered headdress. Its feathers are all gone now, or a few little remaining bits, but um, that was in a Spanish drawer for 200 years. Wow. And Vuna was the individual who gifted that item to Malaspina, Alejandro Malaspina, who took it back to Spain. And I think it's a perfect example of that that exquisite nuanced gifting that goes on um, by Tongans and other Polynesians, where they knew what they were presenting, showed their, their prestige, their power, just, just how powerful and wonderful they were. And sending these items back to elites in, in Europe advertised that to those elites because they could understand that these were just you know, voyagers who, who were working on behalf of, of European elites. And I think the fact that, again, their success in doing that is, you know, over 200 years later, here am I talking to you about you, these things, showing you what remains of the artifacts and being able to tell you that it was Vuna who gifted it to Alejandro Malaspina. Here is again, just a picture to show you what it looked like more in a, its magnificent times. This is of Tui Tonga Pau and was from the Cook expeditions that visited Tonga in the 1770s. There was some controversy, which again, we spent some time looking at the artifact in an artifact of what was claimed to be a feather headdress in um, Austria, in Vienna. And Spain talked about, and there was some um, uh, idea that maybe what was in, in Madrid was not a feather headdress, a pala tabake from Tonga. And one of the curators um, positioned this on that engraving so you could see that, yes, indeed, it is the same, same object. Um, <laughs> maybe not the same one, but certainly <clears throat> the same kind. And finally, the other thing that we became very interested in, in terms of the... Um, these beautiful, exquisite, precious items of art is how um, contemporary Tongans are, um, are reacting to them. And almost immediately, we, we were very careful about putting things up on social media, you know, with obviously permission of the museums. And was that the response from Tongan artists and Tongans um, within uh, who lived in the island group as well as the diaspora to it. And so here somebody has taken that um, uh, pala tabake, put it on a piece of bark cloth, natu, and again made an image showing both of them. So it was that connection from the present to the past as well that was going on. The other thing that became quite interesting to us in terms of looking at these items and how they were exchanged and who was exchanging them is that these are not items that were stolen from Tonga. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other items um, from the Pacific that were taken um, and not taken under um, you know, good circumstances, they were stolen. These clearly were gifted items and they were gifted quite strategically and the items themselves were, as I said, exquisitely made. These are not just random things that were being made. They were um, carefully made for divine people and were carefully gifted in terms of trying to express and communicate to people outside the Tongan islands who these people were. 
So it's, it's been exciting and it's been an exciting project. Each of us had our own um, area that we were interested in. And um, we've each been able to contribute, uh, understanding, do research in our own areas, but here and contribute to the wider discussions that were going on both in the museums and afterwards. Um, the final slide that I have is of a wonderful art exhibition. Um, the, the work of um, Dagmar and Felipe in their response to what they, they experienced looking at um, the older artifacts as well as um, a few other people as well, putting material out. And it was just an exciting um, exhibition last year. I don't wanna to talk too much about it, just to say that it was so gratifying and so moving and so instructional mm -hmm. in terms of what the connections between the present and the past were. Mm -hmm. But I wanna turn over now to Dagmar so that she can explain herself what she was doing with her own art. Great. Interesting, Phyllis, you and I chose the same image to start our slides with. Um, but I think that's indicative of how important the group was and that we are recognizing the, the people that you know we worked alongside for five years. Um, and you do become a family, um, a whānau. So um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. You'll, I won't go through all the names. What I will probably do is just sort of flick through the slides. I might speak to them, but then I might speak over them as well. But um, I'll just walk us through, um, I guess, my my um, connection to the project. So um, it was a unique position to come into the project with. I can distinctly remember picking up the phone and talking to Billy when she asked me would I be interested in being involved in such a project. And I can remember saying, is she for real? Is she actually, go, you know, like is this is like a dream come true for any artist. Um, and I, 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 I was just so humbled to be asked and then to probably um, work alongside our, our senior Tongan artist, Sapoli Malama Filipe Tohi. I think it was just um, yeah, a, a wonderful um, time in our careers to do this. So um, what was really unique about this too was I really um, appreciated that um, it was a relationship built out of respect of one another and you know our different lens and our context that we brought to the project but the power was really shared and um, it, it proved to be to, to, to have some really magical moments so um, you know we've we've had this we've been in this really unique privileged position um, I guess for Philippe and I it's it we come from a place um, you know we're looking at objects, artifacts, our koloa that our ancestors have made. And um, when you think about it and when you come from that position, it's emotional, it's spiritual, um, it's all the feels really. Um, and we're also really mindful that, you know, for most of our Dongan people, they won't be able to travel halfway around the world or, or go down into storehouses. And so we were uh, very mindful of that position, that privilege that we had. So um, we were always sort of focusing on how we can share this, the story, this journey. Um, and so that was, that really hung over Philippe and I as we walked through this um, project. So in each museum, um, they all have different sort of approaches and how we were to engage with them. Um, this is in Vienna. You can see us with our lovely white coats on or, you know, so some museums we could come in with any sort of clothing. Other, other ones would make us put on certain attire to, to meet their um, sort of specific specifications. But I had actually been to Vienna um, a couple of years before um, on my own with Uncle Dennis. And this was with Gabriella Weiss, who was the, um, um, she held the collection. And this struck me so powerfully is that um, she she actually left us both down in the storehouse. I don't know if she minds me sharing, but we she didn't she left us there on our own because she just fully trusted um, that um, we were there to see the the artifacts. She just knew that we needed to spend time with them, and I really valued and appreciated the way in which she um, understood that and um, understood that and, and that high trust model of, you know, these are the people, this is your, she said, Dagmar, these are your, your people, this is for you. So, um, you know, but it was wonderful experiences like that that um, carried 
um, carried along in my heart this, for this project. Um, when we visited um, Vorlitz um, in Germany, um, this was a really fantastic day because this is the first time um, they had any Tongans come to view this particular collection. And we're talking only about three, four years ago. Up till then, no other Tongan had come to see this collection. So it was a really unique day. Um, and, you know, those are, when I'm talking about the emotions, those are sort of things in the back of your head. Not only are you seeing these, these incredible objects, but you're also going, wow, we're the, we're the first. So um, some of these, um, yeah, have been really incredible um, opportunities. Um, in Paris, um, I guess that was probably the one that struck me where we were, um, it was quite intense to get in there, I think. Um, there was a lot of security, um, but Nicholas Garnier, he was fabulous with us, um, spent the whole day, um, but it was quite, uh, quite a big thing to get there and, and walk through and, and finally get down into the storehouse. Um, because really the storehouses hold more of the treasure than what the public see. Um, and, you know, some of these exquisite items um, were just, you know, you, most people would never ever see them. So again, being very mindful of, of that um, with the British Museum, yeah, I'm just completely off site, a, a place a, nowhere near the actual British Museum. The storehouse was sort of kind of an, quite a long way away, quite a, a further away. So understanding how museums work and where they store all their objects and stuff was a real eye opener for me. Um, you can just sort of see how we, we would work. Um, we would spend, we would go in there normally um, quite early in the morning, um, spend most of the day um, photographing, having those conversations, the Dalanoa, um, examining um, these incredible items. Um, and the conversations obviously went, went all around um, and what we were discussing. So I guess that the ang the, the lens in which Felipe and I brought ourselves into the project was we, we come from, I guess for Felipe and I, Felipe being male, I am female. Felipe is Tongan born, I am Aotearoa born. He is full Tongan, I have Tongan German heritage. But the context in which we navigate um, reflects Tongan society today. So we were that was really good that the project team realised, um, you know, sort of to bring those those different lenses in, um, and so that when Philip and I would look at things, I guess, I guess as artists, we're looking at how things are made. Obviously, you know, like the the materiality of the the objects that we were seeing or the artifacts, the color. Um, you know, how were they being produced, really examining, um, you know, how these, these were being constructed um, at a time when, you know, material, even the tools that they would have been using to create these objects would have been, you know, quite very, very different to today. So um, there was for us um, a lot of discussion around that. We were also very um, mindful that, there are there are things that we were viewing that are not not made anymore. We've never seen them anymore uh, in, in everyday society back in Donga. There are just things that have been lost in in terms of construction or or how they are made. This is a perfect example of the Sisyphal and Pit Rivers. Uh, Phyllis showed you a nice sort of um, bird's eye view, but these are some close up shots and. What was spectacular? This is probably one of my favorite pieces. Actually, was because you could see the red feathers. Um, red feathers are talked about, you know, they, they, you, they're written about, but to actually see them, and of course they've, you know, deteriorated somewhat, but you could kind of get a sense of how majestic these pieces would have been, you know, to see them, to see the feathers, um, and, and just this, the craftsmanship, the fine material being used, and just I guess what was also we were wrapping our heads around was how long it would take for some of these pieces to be made. I mean, um, it, it was just something that kind of kept bringing us back. And, you know, you really do come to a, that's sort of us, that's the piece there that we're looking at. So it's not a very big piece, but, you know, you do kind of um, that, that appreciation and just of what our ancestors were, were capable of, of making. And I guess, um, you know, we can really, 
I said to Felipe, if if our ancestors were making that and it's that's in our blood, then surely then you know we should be or we can be uh, creating those as well. So it was sort of a bit of a charge of um, responsibility. Um, this is a lovely shot of Dakota. So um, Phyllis talked about this was a family, a whānau affair. And so, you know, here she is offering her thoughts. And, and it was really like that. You know, we all had a space, a safe space to talk and discuss and share, which was um, really important. Um, I've talked about the privilege to see these things. This is in um, Cambridge now. Um, you know, these, these pieces, I guess, we, we have adapted, you know, now to modern day and how, you know, we have translated these into how and the resourcefulness of materials for today. But I guess for back, um, back when these um, pieces were being created, um, it, it really is just a beautiful, we would literally just stand there and admire it. And, you know, photos don't really do it justice, but what was good for the for the people for like for Rachel Hand here at the University of Cambridge was that um, they also, of course, got something out of this because they're, they're, they're sort of adding to their, um, what's the word, adding to what they they require to, you know, all their information around these, these pieces. Because sometimes we would find that the information they had written or that they'd labelled it sort of one thing and we would say, oh, actually, we think it might be another. And so those discussions were also being had as well. Um, so, yeah, we were um, having those lovely discussion. So you can see us pouring over things, um, very intent. And, you know, these days were quite long, but um, we were really energized. And of course, these conversations didn't just um, happen there. They carried on to lunch or over dinner. And, you know, again, this, the, the lovely um, conversations and um, of what we've been seeing. Um, the, the, the British Museum, I, I want to do a bit of a shout out to them because um, they were the only um, museum that turned to Philippe and I and said, you are Indigenous to these objects that you're going to see. They are your ancestors. And we, we, don't, we are just letting you know that if you don't want to wear gloves, you don't need to. And no one else had said that to us or sort of uh, recognized our position like that. And Philippe and I were really touched by that, that they would um, give us that um, unique opportunity to, to really um, connect with um, our color. So we do understand you wear gloves because um, as I also have learned, you know, they spray the things to protect the objects, but it was the, the intent that I appreciated and that, you know, they offered that as an option to us. And for Philippe and I, we really um, were thankful that they, they um, offered that. Um, what, what also struck Philippe and I was just the, the amount, I guess, of objects across the world and I guess just how prolific our ancestors were in their making and their, um, and their also, you know, just how many objects were collected. Um, we've, we were we're very mindful of the role that, you know, I guess I have a tension uh, between the role of the museum and, you know, um, obviously for some, you know, our Tongan, what we don't have back in Tonga is a purpose-built um, place to house our things if we were to, you know, if they were to come back, if there was ever a conversation around that. There's no air-conditioned settings to preserve them. So for Philip and I, we do understand and we did appreciate that because they are housed properly, we have them today to look at and to, um, to, to, to yeah. So there is that element of um, if, they, if they weren't in museums, we, would, we wouldn't even be able to see them today. So a lot of these things would have perished along the way. So um, there is, we have that um, real appreciation and gratitude for, for our, some of our, um, for these things to still be there and for us to, to look at and, and to learn from. For Philip and I, um, it was really important that our project, um, Phyllis touched on this, that it had a connection back to our to Tonga. For us, um, if it wasn't going to go back to Tonga, there was really, for, for us, it was just a no-brainer. It actually had to go back. We, we were like, we were adamant 
um, before um, we share our findings anywhere, um, we want to take it back to Tonga. And when we um, approached the team, Phyllis and um, Melanite and Billy, and, and proposed that to them, they were just so fully supportive and just, just fully got behind us to say, of course, it has to go back there first. So um, this is um, for a week in October. We went back to um, to Donga, and we were gratefully supported by Crave New Zealand and also the Tano Hotel Group, um, who um, how, um, hosted us, and we were able to um, go back, um, put up some of our our work as a taster, a pre taster for our main exhibition at the Pa Homestead, um, but but ultimately to go back and spend time with our, um, our, our knowledge holders back in Donga. So what we did was we all presented, we all had a um, two day symposium. Um, and, and this is our second day of conference attendees. Um, not everyone obviously, but just those that were there for the photo. Um, but we really just, I just really want to acknowledge um, our keynote speaker for, um, for that day, which was um, Dowager Lady Tunuaka Manu Felakepa. So she was able to, um, she is, what would I say? She is totally the guru of, um, of all things around Tonga culture and traditions. And she was able to um, share her story and, and also look and give feedback because ultimately, you know, uh, we knew that back in Donga was where we were gonna answer a lot of our questions about some of the things that we were um, we had seen overseas and then taking it back to Donga and to have those conversations. So um, here's Lady Tuna and um, she was just wonderful. Um, and we were also, of course, for us as artists, we want to um, totoko support our local, our Tongan artists back in Tonga. So um, it was really important that we, um, did other group shows to celebrate and um, showcase the incredible talent that we have back in Donga. Um, and, a, and a contingent of New Zealand-based Dongan artists went up. So that's us on the right-hand side, um, just a poor, small portion of us that went up. So um, it was wonderful that, um, you know, and that's the thing about collectiveness is that we were all, we knew how important it was for okay, it's Philippe and I in this particular, but it's actually not. <laughs> it's, it would never be just us two. There's, we're all in it together. Um, and we wanted to bring everyone on the journey with us. So, and, and to celebrate these things. And so we were really important. So we knew that there was a conference in town in the Hualofa, but you know, that's a bit, that's a barrier for some of our people to get to. So for Philippe and I, again, we were just sort of um, working at how best we can go out to share the story. To, to um, So we went out to do a couple of evenings out in villages. So we did some outreaches, um, one to a group of children, secondary school students. And then um, we went to um, Holma, and which is um, the village of Lord Vaya, who was sitting in the middle there. Um, and we spent an evening with him. And this, the knowledge we gained from an evening with him and his group of um, people was incredible and were able to sort of feed into, um, you know, more understanding. And so of course, you can see Rachel Hand was there from University of Cambridge. And of course, she was furiously writing down all these things because she was actually getting the real stuff. So um, I think for Rachel, that was a real eye opener into how you can engage authentically with Indigenous communities and take the museum to the people. So that was a really powerful way of um, connecting um, and, and working that way. So I think it's a good sort of um, blueprint for how we can work in the future. I just want to do a shout out to our Silica crew. Um, again, just, you know, it was just this project is is multi-layered and I just kind of wanted to show that to you guys tonight that it's just um it's about a big team effort of of um embracing and connecting all people together um we had the team from um Dessau Wallets come out because um they had made replicas um during um pre oh Phyllis how does it go it was pre um pre because they were east germany so in east german when they were east germany they created these plastic replicas of what we're holding there they are actual replicas of the real tongan items and then they brought them back to tonga to gift them back to the museum in donga so that was a really lovely um 
another little arm of the project, another outcome we didn't expect would happen, but it happened and um, we were really happy for that. Uh, we managed to get across to Sydney to see, um, to work in the collections over there, some fantastic ngatu that was unrolled for us. Nearly their team, I'm sorry to take so long. Um, Can I just wanted, you know, of course we were here in Aotearoa as well. So Canterbury Museum, um, I spent a day down there in the storehouses. Um, and of course, here we go, shout out to our Auckland War Memorial Museum. And of course, with the beautiful Ruby who took us through the collection, um, really important that of course, we have to go to Auckland as well. So, um, and we went down to Otago. That was probably our last one just before um, our exhibition. So very quickly, team, I'm going to take you through. So this time last year, we were part of the Auckland Arts Festival. And so Philippe and I's biggest outcome was to create works as a response to all the beautiful things that we had seen. And um, just very quickly, I'll take you through. Um, we were responding to um, the collections that we had been and, and um, witnessed um, and so what was also really important, um, and this is a good shot to describe, um, is that we wanted to have some of the actual artifacts or the color inside sitting beside our artwork to speak to one another. So Auckland War Memorial kindly loaned us, um, I think there were six to eight items, um, and we had two ngatu from um, Canterbury, Canterbury Museum loaned to us as well. Um, and we were just really thankful that um, we could partner like that and I think this project is a, a wonderful example of how, again, you know, working with artists and communities um, and bringing the collections into different spaces. So into a gallery context and then beside artworks um, and just how they all connect and speak. So you'll, you know, if you were there, you would be able to make all the connections with uh, some of the objects and stuff that Philippe and I were talking about. I don't know if you recall, there was a photo of Felipe studying one of these Kali headrests. And this is the um, testament to his um, skills and his workmanship as an artist, that he was able to replicate these and create them himself. Um, so, you know, Felipe is not here tonight, but it really just shows just how um, incredible he is, is at, at being able to uh, problem solve, um, you know, some of these ancient ways of creating our um, objects and he did them so beautifully at the Pa Homestead. And I think this is my final slide. Um, and yeah, so I guess those again, just responses and the different ways in which um, as artists, uh, both Philip and I approached our art making to tell the story and to really pay, pay homage um, to to the amount of beautiful things that we were we had the absolute privilege of seeing on our on our journey. So there you go, team. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, that's uh, that's real quick, fast, fast and furious <laughs> through the collections. Um, but um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity um, to share this evening. Um, thanks, Marilyn, for your um, insight to do this and um, putting it all together. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah. Okay. Malo. Malo, Malo Lava. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Phyllis and Dagmar. That was incredible, both uh, of what you both contributed. If you've liked this video, please make sure you like and subscribe so you can check out more of our cafes in the future. <laughs>